Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you very much for joining me for the latest in the Health System series of webinars. Uh, this particular theme is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. It's one of many that we've been doing over the last 15 months. The reason we've done it over the last 15 months is because it's an extremely important subject. And it's one that uh, we internally have been doing lots of work on to make sure that we are self GDPR compliant and we're helping many customers throughout the world as well to make sure that they're also GDPR compliant. So my name is Don McCall. I'm the Technical Director for Help Systems in EMEA, uh, which means I look after developers and technical people, technical services people, that cover all the help system solutions that we have available within EMEA. And we'll be talking about some of them as we go through the webinar today. So what will we be talking about over the next 50 minutes or so? We've talked about the purpose of the General Data Protection Regulation and who it affects. <clears throat> now, we've been talking about this for a while. Some of you may have seen some of this content before. Um, some of it will be for the first time. We've updated it, refreshed it with the latest uh, announcements of the GDPR as it goes along. So literally on a weekly basis, there's more information coming to light as how it's going to affect us, and it's going to be extremely important. We'll also cover the GDPR implications in particular the penalties and notifications and what you have to do in the event of a breach or a suspected data breach. I am going to cover, because it's extremely important, the eight rights of the data subjects. It's extremely important, and I'll explain a bit more about that, why it's so important to everybody on this call and myself personally as well when we get to that. One of the things we have to do as a company is identify the data that we process and store, where it came from, and why we have it. And then what I will do is, for the first time, we're talking about some help system bundles that we have. I'll bring up the bundles partway through, maybe 20 minutes or so, and then towards the end of the webinar, we'll hone in on some of those bundles and some of the GDPR-specific solutions that we've implemented internally ourselves and for lots of customers worldwide. There is a chat window, so if you do want to ask any questions, do feel free to ask the questions via the chat window. I do have a lot of content to cover in quite a short space of time. So what I'll do, do submit any questions that you wish during the presentation. Um, I will make time at the end if I possibly can to answer some of them. However, fear not, any I don't answer, I will make sure I personally respond to every single one after the webinar. Uh, the webinar will be recorded, so you will get a link to that and it will appear on the Health Systems website as well. Okay, so the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, what is it and what is its purpose? The important part of this slide is that it's a new legal framework. Legal is the word you want to, to hang on to. It places the current Data Protection Directive and the Data Protection Act. And the Data Protection Directive had the lovely name of 9546 EC. 95 is 1995. So that's when the directive first came out. And in 1998, three years later, the Data Protection Act okay, was, was born as well. Now, as you can imagine, back in 1998, the amount and the types of information, personal information, relating to you that was available or that you shared with people or that you had access to, it was minimal. For example, you probably didn't work, walk about with a computer in your pocket in the name of an iPhone or an Android phone or any other device like that or a tablet. So the volumes of data have just increased immensely. Um, who would have thought we'd be doing a lot of our shopping online as well? So personal data is exchanged there. Who would have thought you probably don't walk into, physically walk into a bank very often anymore? So much personal data being used by companies uh, that we give away freely uh, that we need to make sure it's protected. The, it's been replaced by the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, comes into effect in May 2018, May the 25th, 2018, to be precise. And its purpose is great for us. It's great for us as people, as data subjects, as persons, whatever you want to call us. It's great for us because it's there to protect our personal data. It also defines how organizations store, process, destroy data when it's no longer required. It gives us lots of rights, lots more rights than we currently have under the existing Data Protection Act and the Data Protection Directive. So we're talking only about personal data, not company data, personal data. That's all we're talking about. And the rules or the laws around it are uh, 
extended to what happens to our data as companies that use it, how we transfer data between EU and non-EU locations. It governs very strictly what we have to do, what companies have to do if there's a data breach or a suspected data breach, and uh, very clearly lays out the consequences read into that fines that organisations will um, suffer following a breach. So, let's continue. Um, who does the GDPR affect? Everybody on this call for sure, and I'm not just guessing that, I'm pretty certain that'll be the case. It affects any company that does business in EU countries. If you're a company that does business in an EU country, it applies to you. It applies to data that we use, we need to know where it exists, where it's held, who's got access to it, how it's processed. Not just by us internally, but by who we share it with as well. If I can give you a bit of a test case, there was a, this is a while ago now, a good few months ago, you're an American company, and they are based in America, all their web servers are based in America, and they host websites in America targeting Polish citizens. Now, we know the target Polish citizens because the website's in Polish. They said, it doesn't matter to us, we're an American company, it applies fully. Also applies as to where your data is processed as well. So every person on this call will be affected by the GDPR and will have to comply with it. This is important, but did you know the GDPR is a regulation, the Data Protection Act is a directive. Do you know the difference? I'll tell you. The difference between a regulation and a directive is we currently have a directive. And in 1995, the directive was published and it said, you know what, we need to look after personal data. Here's some rules that we think you should follow. This is the direction that you should take. And people went off and interpreted it almost however they liked. I'm not being blasé about it, but the rules now are pretty open and open to interpretation. The General Data Protection Regulation is a law. It becomes a law. And it says these are the rules you have to follow. Not the direction you can take. Don't interpret them however you want to take them. This is a law that's going to give us commonality across all the EU members and how we look after personal data. And because it's a law, you can break it. A directive, it's loosely speaking, it's something that you follow loosely. Uh, one example being, um, at the moment, you uh, have to notify a data breach in a reasonable amount of time. Yahoo decided that was two years. Guess what? It was, because there was nothing to say against it. Under the General Data Protection Regulation, it's a very small amount of time. We'll come on to that in a moment. If you don't notify a data breach within a very small amount of time, you've broken the law. It's easy to say you've broken laws if you've told you what the law is. If you break the law, you'll get fined. What I will do at this point, I've literally just got two polling questions. I'm just going to open my first poll just for a couple of minutes. And the polling question is, what operating systems do you use that contains data that must be GDPR compliant? And what I mean by that is, operating systems are servers that you hold personal data on. Okay, I'll just leave that running. Okay, so what's new in the General Data Protection Regulation? So we will go into this in a bit more breadth as well. What's new, start from the bottom up? New rights for data subjects. So this already, it's, we've got some great rights as people. We can make sure our personal data is looked after, and the people, the custodians that look after our personal data, if they don't look after it properly, they will be fined. It makes it really good for us. Breach notification policies I've just touched on, it's 72 hours now, not a reasonable amount of time, and it is 72 hours. If you believe there's been a data breach, even if you don't know what it is, you must report it to the supervisor authorities within 72 hours. If you don't, you'll be fine. So you must have a process in place to identify the steps to take in the event of a data breach. Another thing that's changed is internal roles. We have data protection officers, controllers, and processors. Have they now, don't we? Yes, we do. However, with the new law, the new GDPR, that's changed. We'll touch on that as well. And then the consequences or the fines, some huge fines that can now be implemented um, if we don't conform fully with the new law. Okay, so looking at the poll, we have 54%, 57, sorry, 51% companies have not started them. Let's have a look. What operating system you apply? Which you apply? Okay, 41% Windows, not too unexpected there. 
19% Linux, 30% IBM, IBM I, it's great on that there. Um, so we're looking at really IBM I and Windows are the most common operating systems that have personal data on, again, no surprise there. And then we have Linux, AIX, another, sure enough, the rest. Okay, so I'll just close that poll. Thank you very much for participating in that. There will be, will be one more question uh, later on in the presentation as well. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at what's a personal data breach. So we speak about looking after data, and we talk about saying that um, we must make sure that personal data is looked after properly. Um, and we have to say as well that um, what happens in the event of a breach? Well, in the event of a breach, um, we have certain rules and regulations we need to follow. But people quite often think that a data breach is just an exposure of data. So people might have hacked in and stolen some data and they can access our personal data. It's more than that. And this is the definition of it within the GDPR. The breach of security includes the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, or disclosure of, or access to personal data transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. Now, storing personal data makes you a processor, even if all you do is store that data. So if you're a managed service provider or a data center, and all you're doing is storing data, you still have to, after May 25th, comply with the rules of the GDPR. So in the event of a data breach, what can you do? Well, you have to prepare for it. You have to know how to recognize what a data breach is. You also have to report it within 72 hours, as opposed to a reasonable time period. You have to have a policy in place to report the breach, and that policy must show how you can stop the breach and prevent it happening again. Now, a phrase that I use commonly is prepare to be challenged. Prepare to be challenged by the, in the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, who will, and not like the word police, but they will, let's say, minister and make sure that uh, we keep on track and make sure that we do comply with the rules of the uh, the uh, general data protection regulation. So having a policy in place in the event of a suspected data breach or an actual data breach means you must report the data breach, in our case, to the Information Commissioner's Office or the supervisory body in your country. When you report that data breach, you have to include how many individuals you think are affected and how many records you think are affected. I say think because you may not know the full extent of the data breach at that point in time, and that's okay. You're allowed to report data breaches in phases. You must know the name and contact details of the data protection officer or the most senior person looking after the security within your company. And if you don't have a data protection officer, you must know how to report it to the information commissioner's office. You must also say at that point in time what you believe the likely consequences are of the breach, and also what you've done to mitigate the breach. So you have to have a policy to say, in the event of a data breach, this is what we'll do. If you don't report it within 72 hours, you better have a very good reason to make sure you don't get an extremely large fine. Um, now that's reporting a data breach to the uh, data protection officer in your company and then reporting it to the supervisory authority. Now, there are some really good things to do for uh, within the GDPR that is different than Data Protection Act. And this is to do with uh, the notification to individuals. At the moment, if there's a data breach, you should notify the individuals who are um, affected. Under the GDPR, you don't have to notify the individuals unless there's a high risk to their rights and freedoms. Now, it doesn't give you an excuse not to report it. You have to have a documented reason you have to have done a privacy impact assessment as to why you think you don't have to report it to individuals. Um, one of the things you can do, we'll talk about this, is that you can put in technological uh, processes and procedures such as our encryption technology. So if you have an exposure of personal information and the data is encrypted and only one of the keys is there cannot be unencrypted, you don't have to notify the individuals. Now the reason that's amazingly good is it won't affect your reputation. It means all your customers don't have to know because their data is effectively still secure. It means you won't be on the news. It means that you don't make damage. Um, and it also helps to alleviate the size of the fine if you put in technical measures to implement the GDPR. 
Um, if there is a high risk, you do have to notify the individuals. You have to tell them the nature of the likely consequences, who they can contact, uh, what you've done at that point in time, and you must keep them updated. Uh, but like I say, not required for the data is unintelligible. That's a really good thing. It's a really good thing. Uh, These are some examples of when you could potentially be fined uh, after a data breach. So if you fail to implement, this is probably the most important one, if you fail to implement technical and organizational measures. Organizational measures are making sure you've got policies and procedures in place that every employee can follow. I'll talk about that in a moment. Technical is putting in measures such as antivirus software, such as encryption, such as audit and who's got access to all your systems for your whole personal data, implement the role-based access. And that, as you probably imagine, is one of the areas we've been very successful and we can help you in. Failure to maintain written records, you do have to keep an audit of who has access to data and uh, auditing um, list of, of what you've actually done, who's accessed it, when and why. So when challenged, there's that term again, when challenged, you can actually document and prove why and who has had access to the personal data. Um, you'd also be signed for reporting to report your data breach uh, within 72 hours. And that fine is a mere 2% of your entire global turnover for the previous year, or 10 million euros. If you fail to act upon, you have a data breach and fail to act upon the recommendations of the Information Commissioner's Office, now up to fine to 20 million or 4%. Now, a really interesting point, the 4%, it's not an area I'm going to spend any time on today, but just be aware of it, failure to obtain consent. So we are concentrating on ensuring that personal data is secure. You also have to obtain consent to use that um, from a marketing perspective, typically. If you don't have the right consent to use that data in the first place, you can see it's classed as really serious breach, and it's 20 million euros or 4%. Uh, failure to adhere to the GDPR rules for transferring data, international transfers, is 20 million or 4%. They're just some of the examples to give you an idea of where you can open yourself up for a fine. It's not intended to scare you, it's just to tell you it is a law and you can get fined. So if you put in technological measures and you put in organizational measures, that will certainly help. Now, I wanted to raise this. These are some of the existing fines that have been issued um, up until, uh, since 1995. These are quite recent ones. That I think pretty much everybody in call will know about these. Um, I do want to highlight the difference between the existing act and the new law. Tesco Bank had organizational measures in place, very good ones. They had technical measures in place, very good ones, but there was still a breach and affected individuals. They told all the individuals and they were fined 250,000 pounds. So they paid out two and a half million, that's money they had to pay out that went missing in conversation. But they were fined by the Information Commissioner's Office 250,000 pounds. Is that significant? Yes, it is significant because at the moment, the highest fine that the Information and Commissioner's Office can dole out is £500,000. So it shows you they were very lenient and they recognised that Tesco's had done such, so much to prevent the breach, they only fined them £250,000. If that happened on May the 25th this year, in exactly the same manner, Tesco's bank would have been fined £1.9 billion. Pounds billion pound, because that's a percentage of 2% of their turnover globally last year. It just shows you why we need to really, really make sure that we comply with the rights and we comply with the GDPR. Now, I'm going to get through the eight rights of the GDPR that we have that protects us. I'm just going to open up our second polling question. And the second polling question, I've been asking the same question um, over the last year and a bit. And the question is, how GDPR compliant do you think you'll be by May the 25th? And I'd be interested to see how it varied. Last year, just so you know, last year I asked this question um, on a WebEx here. I asked it in two of the Nordic region countries uh, to an audience as well. And last year, with the exception of insurance companies, nobody was really doing much about it. <laughs> So it was quite interesting. Okay, I'll leave that around for a couple of minutes and we'll go through some of the rights or all the rights that we have to make sure that our personal data is protected. So the eight rights we have are the right to be informed. Now, practically, as a company, this really means we need to update our privacy policies on our website, on our contracts, and various other areas as well. Why is that? Well, I have a right to be informed. So at the first point of contact with a business, 
who I'm going to freely give my personal data to, I need to be informed about what that business is going to do with my data, what personal data it's storing, what it's going to do with it, who it's going to share it with, and how it's protected. Now, you don't need to read out um, 12 pages. Um, you do need to, however, make sure that you direct me to where the full policies are, whether it's on the website, the URL, how a document I can access. Cookie policies fall under this as well. In fact, you want to be informed of cookie policies from this as well. So from a practical point of view, you do need to update your privacy policies on your website. You do need to update your contract. My biggest practical tip I can give you here is, last year, Microsoft updated their OLUP 365 privacy policy. And it's brilliant. It's specific to part of the GDPR. And if you follow the rules of that as well, then um, you, you won't go too far wrong. So emulate what they have in your privacy policies. The right to access gives me the right to ask a company for access to my data. So now, you've already told me at the very beginning that um, how it's going to be used, what you're going to do with it, who you're going to share it with. I could say, I'd like to see that data, please. Show me a copy of that data. Give me access to all the data you hold of me, how you use it, any supplemental data you have. Now, an example I'll give there, and we refer to this in a number of these instances, is financial information. I know if I ask for a credit check on me, they also hold data about my wife because it's supplemental data that may affect uh, my, me financially. They have to share the women as well. Now, to do that, this is the shocker, you need to know where it is. So you need to know what all the personal data is in your company. That's a problem question I should have used, actually. Um, so the poll has closed. So under the GDPR, how compliant will you be by the 25th of May? Fully compliant, 11%. Partially, 24%. 3% not at all, and the others didn't answer. Okay, so fully is 11%. That means there's 89% of us that um, have some work to do in the next few weeks. Okay, thanks very much, everybody, for answering that. Really appreciate it. Okay, the right to rectification. Uh, this is um, here already. So at the moment, if you believe that any personal data held by companies is incorrect, you can ask them to correct it. Now, I'm being a bit blind over the say this. At the moment, it's up to you to prove it's wrong. Under the GDPR, it's not. Uh, if you believe that your data is incorrect, then you can ask to be rectified, and the company must rectify it unless they prove otherwise. Why would they? So they'll rectify it. So that helps us. Now, if you want the real shocker and the one that people must, um, well, for me as a, <laughs> for me as an, an employee, it's great. For me as a company director, I need to ensure that we're compliant with the GDPR. This is quite scary. The right to erase or the right to be forgotten. We've already got that, haven't we? Yes, we have. But remember, it's a directive we take. This is now a law. I have the right to erase you. You have the right to erase you. You can say to a company, I want you to forget about me. The right to be forgotten, I call it. I want you to remove all personal data you have on me, but there's no compelling reason to store it. Now, it could be I'm no longer a customer of yours. It could be I'm an employee who's left the company. Now, you have to act upon that in a... Uh, short period of time and make sure that it is actually, uh, you do forget about me. So that removes, removes all personal data. Now, where it gets more complicated is personal data under the GDPR is far more expansive than it was under the Data Protection Act. It's not just my name, my address, my payroll data, my national insurance number. It now includes certain things such as my IP address that I use on my iPhone when I come in and connect to company Wi-Fi, my key fobs, any CCTV images you may have of me as well. So the right to raise you means you need to remove all that data. Can you comply with that? It's going to be difficult, isn't it? We also have the right to the restriction of processing. Now, this is typically, I would imagine, going to be used only if you think that your data is incorrect. And I can say, please don't use my data. Don't get rid of it. Don't do anything with it. Just stop using it. So store it. Don't process it. Now, that also means you must notify any third parties or anybody else you've shared that information with. So it all goes back to the data mapping. You must know where all that data is. The right to data portability. This is a bit like the right to access, only a bit more powerful. In that, I say, can I have a copy of it, please? So one of the practical uses of this is if you apply for a mortgage or a loan or uh, an insurance quotation, you provide all your information to a company. You can ask them for that in a portable format. GDPR currently specifies 
a CSV file or Excel is okay to do that with. It's a commonly read portable format. The idea being you have to give all that information, I can share it to other companies rather than have to re-enter it. The GDPR just specifies that they would like companies to do electronically. Now, to conform with that, there's two parts to it. One is you need to know the information is, and you need to provide it in a portable format, let's say it's Excel. That's great. As a receiving company, you also need to have a method process in place to receive that information and take it. So that's a, a neat way of saving this time, and I'm hopefully making sure that, especially, I think it might become, uh, that has to be done electronically in the future, uh, at least it'll be secure. The right to object to process is quite an unusual one. Typically, this is to do with direct marketing. So this is another good thing. At the moment, I've been quite close again about this. If a, uh, let's say for example, at the moment, I know when my home phone rings, um, either something bad's happened, or it's somebody telling me that I've had a car accident I never had, or PPI haven't played for something like that. Now, one of the reasons that those companies keep on ringing me is because at the moment they can be fined, and typically they get fined £10,000 and they don't really care. Under the GDPR, when they find 2% or 4% to the entire global turnover, I think they will care. So that's going to help in that as well. But you can actually say, stop processing my data. I don't want you using it. I don't want you doing anything with it. Um, and the company has to stop with immediate effect. The right to not be subject to automated decision making. Uh, it's quite an unusual one, but it's a good one. It, it's, the, the term I'd use here is that you must be able to give your opinion to a human being. So the example I could give there is, let's say again you apply for a loan, or you might go to LinkedIn and apply for a new job, and you input lots of information, and it's a computer program, or certainly not a human, that decides whether you go through to the next round or not. So if that does happen, and you'll know now, or after May, you'll know you'll be subject to automated decision making, because the right to be informed, we have to tell people legally, and the right to have the first point of contact, that they may be subject to automated decision making. You can ask to give your point of view to a human being. You might want to tell them something that uh, is supplementary as well. So with this, um, as a company, it's not too bad to comply with because as long as you can simply let somebody talk to a person and listen to their point of view, you can still say no. It doesn't mean there's no matter right to um, uh, decision making go in their favor. Okay, so how can you comply with it? There's a number of ways you can comply with it. This is one of the items that we have on the um, Health Systems website. There's lots of information. Literally, if you just go to the Health Systems website and search for GDPR, you'll find loads of information. And you'll also find a table that lists the eight rights across the top, um, R128, to and down the left-hand side, you can see some of the solutions that, that we actually have um, that can help you with your journey to GDPR compliance. Uh, what we have done to make it easy, I'll just touch on this now, then I'll carry on with the rest of the information on the GDPR and come back to some of the solutions, certainly not all of them. Uh, we've created some GDPR bundles, and we've grouped our together. If you have an IBMI, um, where you hold your personal data with an IBMI bundle, cross-platform, we cover very heavily. We cover all, all the major operating systems, um, some unusual ones as well. Uh, we've put together a number of bundles. The RDMI bundle, and that's one of the reasons I asked the question, and over a third of you on the webinar today have RDMI as one of the operating systems holding personal data. We have a number of um, solutions ways that help you comply with the GDPR and secure RDMI. We can prevent unauthorized data access to secure systems, role-based access to managing, ensure that appropriate personnel can view and update the personal data. If you can restrict people from accessing the data accidentally, do that. We also have virus protection, what for RDMI, yeah, and other operating systems you wouldn't particularly think of. Uh, we also have encryption of data, cross-platform and data at rest and in transfer, and uh, we've got security policies all cross-platform we can implement for you. Uh, with the security bundle, we also bring into uh, play for cross-platform managed file transfer solutions, and we'll touch on that later on, and encryption techniques. The automation bundle uh, is where we can automate, for example, your right to access, your right to be forgotten. If you imagine how many steps there is in that, we can automate those steps for you. So literally we'll create it with you or you do it yourself once, uh, and then it, it helps you to uh, run those processes and audit them as well. 
when challenged. We also have the access login bundle. Um, jigs are specified that data must not only be secured, but there must be comprehensive audit and access to that data as well. Uh, and we as a company offer you cross-platform security solutions that meet and exceed this requirement. Um, some of the names that, that, that of the actual solutions are Policy Minder, Compliance Monitor, Network Security Authority Operator. Don't worry, you don't need to write them down. Um, I'll, I'll direct you to where they are on the website. And um, we, we do have an offer for you as well. We can help with that as well. There's additional products as well. There's just some of them I wanted to mention. Uh, so we'll touch on a few of them towards the end of the webinar time for them as well. So what can you do to help yourself and prepare for it? And as you know, 11% uh, will be fully prepared. So hopefully this is just confirming what you've already done. For others, it's some of the steps that you can take to practically get on your journey or accelerate your journey to GDPR compliance. You need to identify what data you use and retain. So for the, the eight rights that we all have, you also need to, as a company, make sure that you can um, comply with those eight rights. Now you need to know what data you hold, and that is the data map. That's the first step. Get your privacy policy updated, get your data map in. Find out where your data is first, because that's the most important thing you have, the personal data. Then you can look how to secure it, using technological reason, uh, solutions as well. Uh, but you need to know where it is. Have a look as to why you hold that personal data. Just think as you gather that data, think, do I still need it? If you don't, get rid of it. I'll give you an example. Human resources, even internally, have been shredding and removing a number of documents um, that they no longer need. There's no contractual reason. Now, talk about the right to remove or um, to be forgotten. If you have a contractual or legal basis for retaining information, even if the request has been asked to remove it, you have to still retain it. People will know that. If you've told them the right to be informed, we have a legal contractual reason. So even if the answer is to be removed, you don't. That answer is one of the questions I've been asked during the webinar today. Um, if you don't need the personal data, get rid of it. Why keep it? It opens up to breach. Determine what personal data is and understand how it's changed under the GDPR. Online identifiers, location data are included. I mentioned CCTV images, if they're under your control, are included. Technologically, I mentioned in the data breach, the data is unreadable. You're really helping yourself to um, not be fined. Supermise your data or encrypt it. That's the best technique you can use. Just make sure the data is secure. You also need to document who you share the data with. Is it in Salesforce? Is it in the CRM? Have you shared it with a company that does your backups? Uh, is it in a data center? So you know that you can find the right and you know to remove them you know, to restrict processing to them or anything else that somebody might ask you to do. Create a framework. Now, internally, you need to make sure that everybody knows about the GDPR. I mean everybody. Um, you need to make sure you have, as I mentioned, under the GDPR, organizational, that's people, and processes, technological solutions that we sell. Raise awareness internally. Ask your boss what he or she thinks about the GDPR. If they look blank, tell them they need to worry about it and keep on asking until everybody knows about it. This is a big one, update and review your policies and procedures. You probably already have the right to access. You probably already have somebody saying, kind of copy of all my data. Make sure that you know what all the personal data is and how it's updated. Update any policies and procedures that you have to comply with GDPR. Make sure that it's accessible. Everybody needs to know where they are and needs to be written in plain language. It specifically says plain language, not lawyer speak. Implement the continuous improvement plan. This is another big thing. Under the Data Protection Act, people create the policies or not because there's a direction to take, and they've kind of left and probably haven't been updated. The GDPR is not a one time event, it is now a lifestyle you have to comply with. You can be challenged at any point in the future to implement the continuous improvement plan to review the policies and procedures. Embrace the GDPR, make it part of your working life, just like in the morning. When I get up in the morning before I come to work, I know I have to put on clothes. Um, nobody tells me that, I just know I have to. You need to be thinking, and every employee, every person dealing with personal data needs to be thinking, what I'm about to do does that affect personal data? A software upgrade, you put a new version of the software on, does that remove any uh, access rights we set to default? You have to think of everything you do, if you're developing anything, does that change uh, or affect personal data and how I store it? So you need to think of privacy by design, and data minimization, get rid of what you don't need. This is the 
compliance journey that we mentioned. So step one, raise awareness internally. Make sure that people in the company know what they have to comply with. Evaluate your current policies and procedures. And I think saying that the most common one is the make sure that uh, your privacy policy is updated, your contracts are updated as well. Ask companies, are they GDPR compliant? Companies you deal with, I'm afraid to ask them, are you GDPR compliant or will you be? Because contractually you can cover yourself by making sure that the companies you deal with are GDPR compliant, if they don't, you have to think of something else to do because you're opening yourself up to a breach. Um, identify your compliance requirements, so make sure that you know what the important areas are that you have to address. Create your data map, update your policy procedures, look at the areas you have to address. Implement your new policies and update your existing ones. Implement necessary new technology changes, which we'll cover. Encryption, role-based access, antivirus software. Train your people so they know about it and monitor compliance. Make sure there's a process in place. Now, what I will say, spoiler alert, lots of people on this call work in IT. The GDPR, sometimes people think it's an IT problem, it's not. It's an organizational governance problem that needs to come from the top down. However, typically it's an IT solution. And that's why it falls in the lines of IT. The IT solutions are gonna be making sure that you tell everybody we've got to secure the data from the outside in. These are the solutions that we can implement that will help us along our journey to GDPR compliance. Okay, so I've put a lot of information there um, in a short space of time. I've mentioned you can update your policies and procedures, practical measures, make sure people know about it. Now I'm going to touch on just some of the solutions, just some of them, I mentioned the bundles we have. We bundle some of these solutions together. These are some of the technological solutions that you can implement if you haven't already to ensure that personal data is secure regardless of platform they're resigned on. Um, Health Systems has a number of best breed security solutions for IBM I, Windows, Linux, AIX, and other operating systems as well. This is our wheel of security solutions. I'm just going to touch on a few of them. And the reason I picked these ones specifically is because they very much specifically help you on your chief card compliance journey. So encryption. I mentioned if you can encrypt data, in the event of a data breach, if the data's encrypted and the key is not held with it, you're really helping yourself not be subject to a massive fine. Um, this particular solution is encryption at rest and in motion on RBMI, called Crypto Complete. It, it's very simple to use. Uh, is there an overhead? Yeah, of course there is. It's encryption, it's minimal. It's a very mature solution we update all the time, and it helps you comply with a number of um, regulations. It will certainly help with the GDPR. It allows you through authorization lists to grant users access to fully decrypted fuel values or mask values, and we complete deny access. Now, the great thing is it means that, very simply, you can um, have people access, let's say, credit card information, or, no, let's say it's personal information, applies to the GDPR. You can have people accessing a uh, field of personal information in, they can only see the bits that's relevant to their role. Or, it will look like it's real information when it's not. So if somebody does try and hack in intentionally or from outside the company, um, then it, it can look like real data, but it's not. So it's a great way of, of making sure that you can comply as best as you possibly can with the technological measures. I mentioned lots of rights to access, and we've got a solution, cross-platform solution. Windows, Linux, AIX, it also works with cloud-based as well. Uh, this is called Automate. It's a great name because it automates your processes. It can automate pretty much any IT or business process. Now, the reason that we, we've used this for years is the purpose of, um, it's a superb solution that lets you automate, for example, onboarding and offboarding of new employees. We've been using it for years for automating technical processes, for updating spreadsheets automatically, whatever you like. We've been using it internally and also for a number of clients to automate the, the eight rights. So if you do have a right to access, you could, for example, say, okay, I'm going to execute the right to access. I've identified you are who you say you are, and you can use an automate task to go off and gather all the information in all the different places, whether that's payroll, uh, a, a expenses system, email, external CRM system, 
uh, cloud-based system, go gather that information and produce it in the format you need. You can also automate the right to be forgotten. And the good thing is you can automate, it allows you, to, it, it comes with full auditing. So when challenged by the information of the Commissioner's Office, you can say, we're complying with the rules and regulations, and look, we audit it as well. Now, I know I'm talking very quickly, covering a lot of the information, and we've got all the time in the world to, to talk to every single one of you after, and just contact us, and we'll quite happily help you out. So, virus and malware protection, well, I've got that in the window, haven't I? I'd imagine you probably have. But, it's not enough. You can also have it natively on IDMI, AIX, or Linux. Now, why would you need it natively on IBMI, AX, and Linux? Because people quite often say, well, you can't, can't get a, a virus on IBMI. Well, you're quite right. You can't infect, for example, a database 2 file or a RPG program. People say the same on AX and Linux. Well, you can't get a virus on there. Um, you can host a virus, and you can replicate a virus, and you are susceptible to a virus as well. Now. You might have all your PCs connected to an IBMI AX or Linux server, perhaps with a Mac drive, perhaps you've got an ADVC connection. <clears throat> now, because if you get a virus that gets through on the PC connecting to, you can host a virus. I'll give you an example of what happened. So this happened on two IBMI clients I know and one AIX client. Uh, with uh, recent last few months, I'm sure it happened on more, but. Um, the uh, crypto locker virus came, infected a number of PCs. There are lots of people out of business, the NHS, for example. And people naively thought, I'm OK, and I'll be am I, and I explain it. Now, I can tell you of three instances I personally know of, and I'm sure there's more. With crypto locker, let's click on IBMI. What it did, it, connect, it gets a file, and it copies it. And then encrypts it, and then deletes the original. Well, guess what? So it's a map drive onto the IFS. Yeah, try to copy a file on the IFS, you couldn't do it, because the IBM I is so secure, isn't it? No, it's not. It's securable. This is why the virus checker comes in. It couldn't copy the file, so big tick for IBM I and AIX. Couldn't copy it, so it tried to encrypt it. Couldn't, couldn't encrypt it. IBM I AIX didn't let it do it. So it deleted the original. Yep, did that quite happily delete it. The original was deleted, and unfortunately, or the company is trying to hire the delete service. Unfortunately, why is that? Because it replicated the delete file across, and the only way it could get about it was before resource. <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons that you do need antivirus software on more than just your Windows servers. Now, I'm going to touch on a slightly different regu regulation, the payment card industry. They had, uh, sort of for credit card information, they had a recommendation for a number of years that they recommended that any systems connected to uh, uh, that um, could access credit card information had a virus checker. With 3.2 this year, they made it a requirement. And we can quite see that happening with the GDPR as well eventually. Managed file transfer, cross platform solution, Windows, Linux, AOS, RPMI, cloud based. This is a full and managed file transfer solution. Notice it says manage, not secure. It's both. It's a fully managed solution. The MFT solution for encryption, it's for the upload and transfer of important files and documents. It works for the email. They so have a, an email plugin as well. You can send secure emails or send people a link. You can then securely get a file encrypted as well from you. We can then audit it. We can make sure it's not being touched along the way. It's got Dropbox-like technology for secure folders as well, cross-platform. And it provides workflows as well for automation and auditing of the activity end to end. For example, RPMI, Unix, Linux, whatever you like. We've implemented this in small companies. We've implemented this just recently um, in um, companies 50,000 employees to make sure that all the file transfers, and really let's just say data transfers, between internally, between other EU countries and all their trading partners as well are secure to help them to apply the GDPR. These are some of the areas that it helps you look after as well. Uh, so there's workflow automation, again, it's audited, there's alerted, secure email, secure folders, and secure email as well. It's browser-based. 
So it is really easy to use. It supports all the NIST sanctions algorithms such as AES 128, 256-bit. You can um, perform MAMS file transfers using numerous protocols such as SFTP, FTPS, AS2, HTTPS, and AES. Integrates a variety of backends. I mentioned, are you holding data in external CRM cloud-based systems? This supports that fully. It also supports compression, auditing, and masking as well. Okay, so that's just some of the solutions that come in the bundles. It's some of the solutions that we have in the portfolio is just a very, very small amount um, that we can help you with. So all the information is on the website. Um, what Help Systems has done over the years is to uh, look after all our own systems, but all our customers and client systems from a security perspective. We also do it from an ITOMS, document management, business intelligence. Really with the GDPR, we talk about automated processes and security, making sure the data is secure. What we have done, so I've spoke about a lot of solutions here, is we've leveraged our experience in the security industry to build a portfolio of powerful security solutions, cross-platform, really important, cross-platform solutions to provide critical functionality covering every vertical. We've designed them specifically to satisfy regulatory and legislative compliance requirements. That's one of the reasons that we've taken such a vested interest in the last 15 months we've been working on this GDPR solutions. Uh, we extend and leverage the integrated security functions within each of the operating systems and we build upon them. They're there for a reason, but we build upon them and make sure that um, we're all covered as best we possibly can. Uh, all of the solutions that we've mentioned, and a very small few of them, are fully functional, you know, fully functional 30 day trial uh, just by contacting Help Systems. Uh, if you go to the website, you can contact us on there. There's lots of information on the GDPR on the website, lots of information on the solutions that we can offer. We also offer, and these have been really popular, um, almost too popular, <laughs> um, a free 30 minute GDPR readiness consultation. So you go to the Help Systems website, you search for GDPR, and you can uh, request a 30 minute consultation. These have changed. When I did these last year, my team did these. Uh, last with people in European countries, in America as well, as well as myself here, number of that do these GDPR consultations. Typically, with information gathering, you've had a number, a lot of that today. I'd say since December last year, they'd be very specific about your own individual companies and how the GDPR complies, how you have to, what you can do there. They're the questions that we'll happily take. For a 30 minute consultation, we do have to keep it 30 minutes, I'm afraid, to do as many of them but we'll help you answer your specific questions. We'll also help you identify the solutions that you can use and you can have a free take day trial of any of them as well. We can do that manage with you as well. We'll give you all the help you need. Now, we do have a few minutes left, so I'll answer some of the questions. If you just bear with me, I'll just bring up the chat window. There's been lots coming in. So as I say, I'm going through some of these. Um, any of that I don't answer, I will personally answer every single one over the next day or two as well. Um, let's have a look. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, so if personal data is downloaded by an employee to a personal device, smartphone, tablet, etc., for business purposes, who's responsible that data is not stored, encrypted, and the device is lost or stolen? Really, really good question. Uh, you as a company are. Um, you can help protect yourself just as you have an email policy now and a web users policy. Have a GDPR policy and personal data that says you must not download personal data to um, your own devices. If you do, you're, you make sure that uh, it, it, it's looked after following these itself. Now, it's a really good question there because I mentioned very briefly data protection officer, controllers and processors. One of the big changes, I can't believe I didn't mention it. One of the big changes is at the moment, controllers, typically companies who control how data is used, make sure that people that process the data, i.e. employees or people they shared it with, the controllers make sure that they comply with existing regulations. They will also have to make sure they comply with the GDPR. Much harder to do now. Today, in the event of a data breach, you could personally sue and take to court the controllers that control how your data is looked after. After May the 25th, you can, if you wish, personally sue the processors that look after your information, that you process your information. Now, the idea is not to penalize every employee in the company, it's to make sure that companies Make sure they look after employees, i.e., look after your personal data. Uh, let's just 
to one another. Okay, I think I might have answered this. With regards to the right to erasure, there could be a compelling reason to repay the personal information of ex-employees, as there's a requirement to record records of access to client and payroll legal, etc. Quite right. If there's a legal or contractual reason that you have to retain information, such as financial information for it's about eight years, you have to, you can't remove it. Okay. Do these regulations apply to Europeans who now live outside of the EU? This is a really good question, an exceptionally good question. The GDPR applies to EU citizens within the borders of the EU. Now, that means that any EU citizen within the borders of the EU has to vote. I'll give you a practical example from the GDPR consultations with it. One of the banks out in Qatar only deals, quite common, only deal with in the local region. So the reason I had a conversation with them was said, we have a, a, a bank in this region that only deals with people in this region and nobody else, and we hold personal information on them. We have a number of people from Europe that work for us. They live here in this country and they work for us and we hold all their information. Is that okay? Yes, it is. Do we have to comply with GDPR? No, you don't. However, if they go home back to the EU, yes, you do, even if it's one employee, if you still hold them. The only way they could do that was if they went back to uh, the, within the confines of the EU, they'd have to remove all the information and close their accounts. It also applies if you're processing information in the EU as well. So you'd have to be resident here, but the, if you're processing data, you have to make sure it's secure as well. A uh, number of people are saying, can we get a copy of the presentation? Absolutely. Uh, you will get a link sent out, and it will appear on the website as well. Um, one of the comments, okay, thank you very much for a, a good colleague, a very good close colleague of mine saying, we're listening to this presentation about servers. Many people have personal data on the PC. This is scary. Absolutely right, Ranga. <laughs> it is scary. Yeah, it is scary. And it should be. And that's the whole point. Um, we need to make sure that we look after personal data much better than we do now. Okay. Um, I'm going to close up now. I want to thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, it's, uh, I find it a really interesting subject. So if you do want to register for a 30-minute GDPR consultation, please go to the website and do. Me and my team worldwide will happily talk about the GDPR all day long. And also, um, any of the solutions that you've seen or you'd like to know about, just let us know, and then we'll send you a link to them as well. So I'm going to end now. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you again. Talk to you soon.